Good morning. My name is Joseph Borelli, and I'm the chair of the Fire and Emergency Management Committee. I want to start off by congratulating newly appointed Chief of Department, Chief John Sudnick. Applause, applause, maybe. Applause. Applause. And uh, Chief of Fire Operations, Thomas Richardson. Is he here? He's not here, but we'll give him an applause anyway. Uh, with that being said, the committee will review the department's proposed budget for FY 2020, uh, its 2019 to 2023 capital commitment plan, the 10-year capital strategy, relevant sections of the preliminary mayor's management report for FY 19. Uh, second, we will hear from the New York City Emergency Management Department. Uh, the fire department's physical preliminary 2020 budget totals $2.05 billion uh, with 17,321 positions. Uh, we had a productive budget process last year with adding funding for a new squad company on Staten Island. I'm proud of the work that we did together in order to achieve this, and I'm looking forward to working with the commissioner and mayor to bolster the city's budget in different ways. However, we still have a lot of work ahead. Hudson Yards is opening on March 15, 2019. The council continues to monitor the department's diversity recruitment plan, and while unif uniform overtime has been right-sized, we have to start monitoring civilian overtime spending. Lastly, uh, we have to assess the need for additional fire and EMS resources throughout the city and continue to look how best to improve EMS operations through expense and capital budgets. New for fiscal 2020, the city has set a target of $750 million citywide uh, as part of the program to eliminate the gap, or PEG, as it's affectionately known by those in government. We are interested in learning about how this will impact the FDNY. The committee held oversight hearings on various topics last year, the EMS response to the opioid epidemic, the impact uh, of automatic sprinkler systems on fire suppression, the impact of new development on Long Island City uh, on emergency management services, and recently we held an oversight hearing on the protection of EMS workers from job-related violence. As the city experiences substantial increases in call volume for medical emergencies from one year to the next, the department has added, added additional tours and increased its EMS classes at the academy but has not addressed the capital needs to adequately support the growing demands for EMS services. Additionally, the budget doesn't include any additional resources to address fire uh, and EMS needs for Hudson Yards. I am interested in how the budget also addresses those needs because an increase in call volume for medical emergencies and the opening of Hudson Yards are sure to bring different challenges. I want to make sure our committees are adequately served and our firefighters and EMS staff have the resources to meet and adapt to the growing demand and changes. The committee will like to know what the department plans to do to address these deficiencies, as well as an update on the department's recruitment plan uh, and the squad company on Staten Island. Uh, any plans for EMS and what new needs are added in fiscal 2020. I also want to make sure we thank our committee staff for their hard work. By the way, they put this in there. This is like, they, you know, they write this and add their own shout out, which is great. <clears throat> uh, finance analyst, Jin Lee. Uh, uh, unit Head Isha White, uh, Committee Counsel Josh Kingsley, who's unfortunately not with us today, Policy Analyst Will Hongach, and my Chief of Staff Frank Mascia. I'd like to welcome and thank Commissioner Nigro and our firefighters, EMTs, paramedics, and the department's civilian staff for the work they do. I am looking forward to hearing from the Commissioner, uh, and I will uh, swear you in. Would you please raise your right hands? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to respond honestly to council member questions? You may begin. Well, good morning, Chair Borelli and council members present. Thank you for your, the opportunity to speak with you today about the preliminary budget for fiscal year 2020 for the fire department. I'm joined this morning by First Deputy Commissioner Laura Cavanaugh, Chief of Department John Sudnick, Chief of EMS James Booth, and Assistant Commissioner for Budget and Finance, Stephen Rush. I'll begin by acknowledging someone who you've just acknowledged, who's joined me in the past at this table, but now is here in a new capacity. The Fire Department has a new Chief of Department. John Sudnick has over 33 years of experience with the FDNY, including time spent as Manhattan Borough Commander, and most recently as Chief of Fire Operations. With John as the highest ranking uniform member of the department, we are in extraordinarily good hands. 2018 was a very busy year for the department. We responded to over 1.7 million incidents. Of these, more than 1.4 million were medical calls. Compared to 2017, that was an increase of approximately 84,000 total responses, or 4.8%. Non-life-threatening emergencies grew by 7%, and life-threatening emergencies by 1%. 
structural fires were up approximately 2%. We know that the reality of the modern day fire service is that we confront a growing number of calls each year. The department has also seen tragedy over the last year. We lost a hero when Lieutenant Michael Davidson died while operating at a fire in Harlem. Two FDNY members died last spring when the helicopter carrying Lieutenant Christopher Ragusa and Fire Marshal Tripp Sinettis and their New York Air National Guard colleagues crashed in Iraq. This past January, firefighter Stephen Pollard was killed while operating at a motor vehicle accident on the Belt Parkway. The entire department mourns the loss of these brave members. One concerning development in 2018 was this, that the city finished the year with 88 fire deaths. This is an increase from the 73 deaths that we experienced in 2017. As the city's population grows, I've committed to strengthening the department's outreach to the community to help prevent fire injuries and deaths. We know that accomplishing our mission to save lives cannot be achieved solely by being reactive to emergencies. As I have detailed to this committee in the past, we also strive to be proactive in connecting with New Yorkers to provide them with an education and tools to protect themselves. In 2018, our fire safety education teams made over 9,100 safety presentations, which was an increase of more than 1,100 from the previous year. A third of these presentations took place in schools so that our educators could discuss fire safety with students and their parents. With the help of council members, we gave away almost 65,000 smoke alarms, smoke alarm batteries during the Change Your Clock, Change Your Batteries campaign. Last summer, we hosted our fourth annual series of block parties. Over 7,000 New Yorkers attended events at firehouses and EMS stations across the city, receiving fire safety information and instruction. We also hosted open houses at all firehouses and EMS stations in the city. 25,000 New Yorkers attended these events and over 10,000 alarms were distributed. We also know that our messaging and outreach is more potent when we engage partners to help us get our message out. Working with the American Red Cross, we distributed 15,000 smoke alarms and we installed another 18,000. This included roughly 6,000 home visits where residents receive working smoke alarms and learn about fire safety. After a series of tragic fires in the Bronx, we worked with the American Red Cross, New York City Emergency Management, the Mayor's Office, and the Bronx Borough President on a series of 30 events between April and June targeting neighborhoods where we thought the outreach would be most effective. In response to a series of fires in Southeast Queens, we provided educational fire safety posters to more than 60 faith-based organizations. We partnered with the Department for the Aging to provide fire safety workshops in senior centers across the city. Since the inception, we've made presentations in approximately 100 locations. We also coordinated with the Department of Youth and Community Development to bring nearly 1,000 K through five students from Beacon after school programs to visit firehouses and receive fire safety education curriculum. The outlook for pursuing valuable partnerships in 2019 is positive. With generous funding from the mayor and the council, we will soon be taking delivery of 60,000 smoke alarms, which we will distribute with our partners at the council and install through our partners at the American Red Cross. We recently announced a program in coordination with the Administration for Children's Services in which we will train 2,000 frontline child welfare staff. These individuals will learn how to examine homes for potential fire hazards and be able to refer families for smoke alarm installations. We are also working to develop campaigns in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, the Mayor's Center for Faith-Based and Community-Based Partnerships, and the Department of Education. Our mobile CPR training programs will, were, was also very successful in 2018, educating New Yorkers to provide aid to others, help save lives. We trained over 27,000 volunteers in compression-only CPR. 
This included training 23,000 students in 110 schools. I'm happy to report that the most recent class to graduate from the Firefighter Academy, which consisted of promotional candidates from EMS, included 15 female graduates. This was the highest number of female candidates to graduate in a single class since 1982, which was the first class in which women were eligible. Through their brave service, these women will inspire women and girls from across the city to follow in their footsteps. With the addition of these graduates, the department now has the largest number of female firefighters in its history. We have a long way to go, but we are proud of the progress we are making. The increase in the number of medical incidents that we respond to is a trend that has been experienced by emergency medical services across the country. Recently, the department has seen a rapid growth, a 25% increase in the last decade in the number of calls from stable patients who need care for minor medical injuries or management of non-life-threatening chronic diseases. This practice is not only costly to the patient, but it creates a higher workload and reduces the availability of ambulances. Patients and municipalities would be better served by a more robust range of options beyond requiring EMS services to transport patients to hospitals. A key challenge, though, has been the antiquated Medicare regulations followed in lockstep by Medicaid and many health insurance carriers that classify EMS as a transportation service, reimbursing only if the patient is transported to a hospital's emergency department. However, working with EMS services nationwide, FDNY has led the way in pursuing changes to the way that Medicare reimburses these responses. The federal Medicare program has agreed to begin adopting changes. The current system is no longer working for patients or EMS systems. Much work and planning remains, but we have begun removing the financial disincentives to changing it. By forming partnerships with community-based healthcare options and driving innovative changes to the way that we operate, these changes can break the current unsustainable cycle and improve health care for all patients. The department has also made progress on several new or renovated facilities. Among the highlights, property has been acquired and the Department of Design and Dis Construction has selected an architect for a new firehouse for engine company 268 in the Rockaways. DDC has begun the design for EMS Station 17 in the Bronx. Construction is nearing completion on a new facility for Rescue 2, which will be a 21,400 square foot fire station in Brooklyn. DDC estimates the work will be complete in the fall of 2019. We are also about to begin construction on a major expansion and renovation of EMS Station 20 in the Bronx. Finally, as the chair is aware, Squad Company 8 began operating in Staten Island in December of 2018. We are gratified to get it up and running within five months of announcing the creation of the company. The mayor's preliminary budget includes a series of small additions to the fire department's budget. This includes funding for 20 additional lines in the Bureau of Fire Prevention, which will help the department to better serve small businesses by improving customer service and maximizing the efficiency of plan examinations. It also includes OTPS funding to support information technology projects and radio maintenance for PSAC 2, the city's public safety answering center located in the Bronx. Further, the budget will fund an additional three staff lines in the department's Equal Employment Opportunity Office. These lines will be used to hire attorneys who will provide training to the fire department workforce and ensure that th thorough EEO investigations occur in a timely manner. It is the privilege of the men and women of the FDNY to protect the lives and property of the people of New York City. Our challenge is to provide the highest level of service, even as the number of calls and incidents grow each year. We thank the Council for its partnership and assistance in meeting that challenge. And now I'd be happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I don't know if anyone's told you this, but we, we remark how soothing your voice is 
So if you ever uh, leave public service, books on tape would be a, a welcome career move for you. It's, it was very, very nice voice. Uh, we're joined by uh, Council Member Amphrey Samuel from Brooklyn. Good morning. Uh, and I want to just uh, point out that anyone wishing to testify can fill out one of the snazzy forms and give them to the Sergeant at Arms uh, to my left, to your right. Um, uh, Commissioner, the first question is, is sort of the one we always ask. Um, were there any new needs that the department requested uh, that weren't included in the preliminary budget? I think there's always a few small items. The largest item would be an expansion of the fly car pilot, but I would say that that's certainly not off the table, and the department is quite optimistic that we will um, at some point receive that funding and be able to expand what we think is a uh, very important um, issue for the department. Uh, w when is the pilot scheduled to end? Uh, it had no schedule end date. Do right now, it's uh, the pilot stage is over and it's operating. Uh, it's it's in place. It's permanent. But there, there is data to indicate that the program has been successful. We do believe that it has been successful. Um, we are training additional paramedics right now. We have more people in school. And that will give us the ability, when we receive the funding, to be able to expand it uh, further in the Bronx to be able to make a bigger impact. Great. Um, obviously, with the $750 million peg, the FDNY's target, and correct me if I'm wrong, is $6.5 million. Um, can you just go through again where we would see those cuts come from? Well, certainly. None of them will be in our operational uh, portion of the department, and where we see the ability to reach that peg is through additional revenues, both from fire prevention inspection and from uh, ambulance calls. Um, we're also joined by Council Member Brannon. Uh, a little late, a little late, but it's okay. Um, so you, you said nothing's going to come from the frontline services. So there's there's no current change to uniform staff other than the five additional spots? That's correct. Right, okay. Um, and there's no, there's no change in the, in the pace of training new firefighters or EMS uh, operators? Absolutely not. There's no hiring freeze of firefighters or EMTs and paramedics. And will this impact any civilian positions? Well, we do have some current vacancies in <coughs> civilian positions. Um, some of those we do anticipate may not be filled this year. But overall, there'll be an increase of 79 total positions uh, with the department. Uh, what was that there is a, a, a hiring freeze on civilian positions right now, and, um, but not again, not on EMTs, paramedics, firefighters. That would be scrapped, though, in the new budget year. For the new 74 positions? Um, for the hiring freeze, we're awaiting the final guidelines from OMB, but um, generally speaking, um, <coughs> it looks like every position that is approved in our budget will be up for review when it's vacant. And the, the 74 civilian positions you're seeking, uh, you mentioned 20 of them were for the Bureau of Fire Prevention. Um, can, can you just take us through the other uh, 54? You mentioned there were attorneys uh, for EEO complaints. You know, how, how many attorneys? The, f the one in my, in my report, we were hiring three EEO attorneys and 20 fire prevention inspectors. Right. That's, the, that's the financial plan is reflecting 20 and okay. three. Is this the number one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, do you have any employees making minimum wage in the department? And were they f impacted? No. We do not. Um, on the capital side, the uh, the Ro engine 268 in Rockaway, we, we I recall speaking about that last year. W w what sort of has been the delay? I mean, there's an architecture now architecture now on board. Um, what sort of has been the problem with that? I don't think there's been any problem. I think it's the um, the process that the number of steps it goes through, the number of approvals that's required before building begins uh, is quite lengthy and, and quite complicated, but we're at the stage now where it's in the design stage and we can move forward. 
Do you know if you have to go through the Public Design Commission or not? I do not. Okay, hopefully you don't, because that'd be really, really crazy if you did. <clears throat> um, when EMS merged with FDNY in 98, uh, the proposal was to have 70 stations. However, we now have 35, and I think you mentioned we're adding, adding one or renovating one. Uh, what has been sort of the long-term delay in implementing the, the full 70 stations? Well, I don't think, I, I, I don't recall, and I was certainly involved quite uh, directly in the merger, uh, that 70 stations was a written in stone target. I think it might have been a, a goal at that point that's been reevaluated many times since. Okay. So just to, just to go back to that uh, headcount number, the, the number we see in our, in our numbers uh, from FY9 to FY20 was a difference of 74 uh, full-time civilian positions and five full-time uniforms. So that's, that, was from the, uh, that was from our plan. Is, is that, so is that not the correct number? I'm just looking by the financial plan that there's 20 uh, for fire prevention, three in addition for EEO, and then there's a, a technical adjustment of eight positions. Okay. Well, that certainly answers for the 50 I was talking about that don't seem to exist, so that, that's good. Um, how um, many excuse me. It could be on the EMS side, of, which is classified as civilian, so that could be okay. a confusion. Okay, thank you. I'm just thinking of regular civilian. No, right, yeah, it, it doesn't discern here whether it is or it isn't. So. It's, e it's EMS. Um, I mean, is there any, would there be any good reason, though, to reduce the number of EMS uh, operators? No, I mean, this is a growth in EMS. Head okay. Um, how, how many ambulance stations have been integrated with firehouse, uh, firehouses, and, and does the department ever plan on moving away from uh, integrated ambulance stations in the future? Well, right now there are two. Um, there would have to be new facilities because of, uh, you know, our fire stations are barely able to f hold our fire apparatus. Um, it certainly wouldn't be off the table if we had the, the available facilities or if new facilities were being built. Um, that's certainly something we would do. But as you can see, we don't build new facilities very often, and uh, therefore it can't be done very rapidly. Uh, in the FY 2019 to 23 capital plan, um, there's a project, Fort Totten Infrastructure and EMS Expansion, and I think it's, it's been there for a little while. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's any funding for this project. Uh, why is this not a priority, or, or is it a priority, and uh, w what is the long-term plan for funding it? We've been in discussions with OMB um, with, um, with regard to Fort Totten for several years, and we have presented a plan, a long-term plan, to revitalize the fort, make it expand classroom space so we can increase the number of EMTs and paramedics that we train. And there is a funding request in the capital budget that is now being reviewed by OMB as part of the executive plan. Um, just switching gears for a, for a moment to a, a current situation, can we just discuss the, uh, the situation with OLR uh, and the fifth man at 20 companies? Uh, is that, uh, I understand the, the UFA numbers were a fraction of a percentage lower than the contract, uh, the, the contract allows. Is there still a, a plan to pull the fifth man from those 20 engine companies? Uh, right now, we're not pulling the, the fifth man from those 20 units, and we'll we'll it, see how that how that goes. The number is very slightly above the threshold right now, um, but we have not reduced the 20 units. Of, of any of the line of duty injuries that led to those uh, folks missing work. Um, were any of them not accurately recorded? Was there, were, are there any fake injuries? Are there any? I don't think we have fake injuries. I think we, our members um, frequently get injured and report those injuries. It's a very, being a firefighter and a fire officer is very dangerous and uh, it results in a large number of injuries each year. So why then would the, would the stick and carrot approach 
the, the stick end up jeopardizing safety of uh, not just the firefighters in those companies, but sort of the public? I, I think this was a negotiation between the city and the union quite a number of years ago um, as to how we would deal with it. And if it wants to, if they want to negotiate it again, I think that would be fine and see if we could come up with an alternate uh, position. So, so in your opinion, w would it be better then to have um, any type of uh, retribution or, or response to uh, line of duty percentages going higher than normal? Would it be better to have some sort of, uh, you know, maybe a perk related? I, I think I would entertain any other possible solutions to this issue. No ice cream on Fridays type, uh, type stuff rather than now you're getting into some real serious things. Right. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'd go that far, but uh, no, I, I, it, in all seriousness, I, I think alternate solutions to this could be, could be looked at, and I would uh, certainly entertain that. I, I think as would we, as, as we've, just in the short time that I've been chair, uh, we've dealt with this issue twice, and it just seems to, uh, to potentially not go away, uh, as it happened many times before that. Um, with respect to Hudson Yards, we had a, a committee hearing a few months ago on a different potential project uh, and one that didn't go uh, quite as well as Hudson Yards in Long Island City. Uh, but a lot of the things that were, were discussed, the need for additional services, also held true for Hudson Yards. Is there, is there you know, what is the status of adding uh, resources to that neighborhood as it's on the verge of opening uh, next week? Well. We are in the process, and we've been in the process for quite some time, of trying to identify a location in the Hudson Yards area in which we could house re department resources, whether they're fire or EMS resources. Um, we have, we don't have any right now. We, we can add units such as rapid response units. We anticipate that with the opening of Hudson Yards, based on the occupancies and based on the uh, construction, that we will not have a serious uptick in fire calls, but we will have an uptick uh, of some degree of emergencies and medical calls. And we're looking on how to address that uptick without having uh, the ability to house additional units in the Hudson Yards uh, area. Of the but, but an engine would still respond to that, though. The units that are there would continue to respond to, those, to the calls in that area, yes. And are the, the units in the battalion in that area right now, would they be considered a, a busier engine companies? Uh, I think our, uh, many of our units in Manhattan are quite busy um, right now and may become slightly busier, and we'll, we'll carefully monitor that, but um, we'll see. We do not anticipate a large increase in fires in the Hudson Yards area, no. And, and last year, we, we spoke about siting an, ambu uh, an ambulance station there. Um, has, has there been any development? I mean, w w what has occurred, I guess, from that moment last year to this moment this year, as far as finding a, a location? Well, we have found a few locations. One of them didn't work out. I think, uh, I think right now we have a potential location, but it'll be quite a while before we're able to occupy that location. Is it, is it city owned or would it have to go through ULIP? Or could it be rented? Uh, I, do we know, Jim? I'm, I'm not certain on that. I, I don't think it's city owned, though. Okay. Uh, I know uh, uh, Council Member Amprey Samuel has uh, some questions. Good morning, everyone. So I'm very glad, of course, to hear in the testimony the increase in female firefighters, obviously um, historic numbers, and as one of 11 women on the council, that makes me smile, even though we have a long way to go. Um, my question is related to um, the toilet upgrades. So the preliminary capital commitment plan includes 2.6 million in fiscal 2019 to upgrade toilets for female firefighters at Engine Company 24. How many engine ladder companies are in need of female firefighter toilet upgrades currently? 
uh, every single house has a facility of some kind. The additional money that you see allocated is in some cases we installed a facility that we then wanted to upgrade or um, change as part of a renovation to the house. So there is a facility of some kind everywhere, but we're looking to upgrade those facilities as time goes on. Um, can you just kind of describe like when you just said the facilities of some kind? Um, I've heard just complaints in the past about what that could possibly look like. So is it something that's a, a, like a totally separate area or is it something where you have like a sign on a door or can you just explain? In every case it is meant to be a completely separate area but in some houses, you know, due to the age or the size of the firehouse, it might have been very small what we were initially able to accommodate and we seek to make that larger, have a larger changing area. So the additional money you see is to accomplish that, is to make sure every facility is uh, as complete as it should be. So what's the like percentage now of completion? Well, 100% of them, as I said, do have a facility of some, some kind in them, yeah. Okay. Um, I could get you, I don't have it here, I could get you which houses we're looking at um, increasing the size of that facility or making additional renovations to it. Okay, please do, just so we can know, you know how we can be supportive. And the, um, the same question as well with EMS, are all EMS stations properly equipped with toilets and or locker rooms for the female in, um, EMTs and paramedics and how many EMS stations are in need of female toilet and or locker room upgrades? To my knowledge, ma'am, uh, all of the ambulance stations are uh, adequately uh, prepared uh, for our female staffers. All? Yes, ma'am, okay. all, all. Okay, all right. And um, I just wanna add that Rescue 2 is in the middle of my district, and it literally is around the corner from my home, and when I stand in front of my house, I can see the backyard of it, and I am very, and the community is very excited about its completion, so we look forward to it. I'm sure they'll be good neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, and as for your question with our EMS facilities, some of them are somewhat overtaxed uh, size-wise, and we're always looking to expand and to improve um, conditions for, for our folks where possible. But everyone has, there are no facilities without female locker rooms, without female bathrooms. Um, they all have them, but like many of our firehouses, some of them can use uh, an upgrade or modernization. Okay, thank you. And uh, what are the plans for the old um, Rescue 2 building on Bergen and Ro the old building? Well, there are many thoughts, but nothing f firm yet as to what will become of that firehouse. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member. Um, j just a, a question about equipment. You didn't really uh, touch on this in uh, in your statement. Uh, is there any new equipment that's being purchased for uh, uh, personnel? Um, we had some discussions last week about uh, EMS worker safety and then, of course, uh, FDNY uh, uh, firefighter safety. Is there any new equipment being funded in this year's budget? We are purchasing new fire hose, is an upgraded fire hose model that we're purchasing. So that's um, one of the items. I mean, we constantly purchase new safety equipment for members, not uh, replacement equipment, I should say. Uh, no new technology. We've recently replaced all of our uh, portable radios. Thermal imaging cameras, new so thermal this, this imaging This question cameras came up in the, in the hearing, um, and I, I, it, it didn't sound like there was a good answer for it. Is there a reason why uh, EMS has to carry a, a, a shoulder-strapped radio as opposed to a belt-clipped radio? Yes, there is, yeah. sir. The, the reason behind the strap is we need a place to co-locate the uh, carbon monoxide detector, which has to be up around your breathing area uh, as per OSHA regulations. There's also a place to anchor the remote microphone, which uh, gives uh, increased uh, availability to hear, understand, get instructions, declare an emergency, hit the emergency alert beacon, and the strap provides the radio to go on and go off easily when they need to dress in their protective equipment uh, in an emergency situation. Um, what is the process overall uh, with respect to private ambulances? Again, this has come up in the past, uh, and I know we're adding new, uh, new 
uh, ambulance tours to address this, but what is the process for, for new tours uh, when a hospital system or provider goes bankrupt or, or chooses to stop? The process is that we evaluate the area in which the uh, entity served. Um, we look and see if we can cover the area with our existing resources by redistribution of either fire department or voluntary uh, hospital resources. Um, and uh, if we cannot do that, we uh, usually run the unit at risk, uh, fire department unit at risk, and we request additional resources uh, from the city. So with respect to, to 33B, it was taken over by the fire department, uh, and then last month it was given back to a, a nonprofit provider or a hospital system? Or? 33 Boy in South Brooklyn, yes. The fire department redistributed their members uh, to staff units, um, and it was a, uh, a unit that was temporarily uh, reassigned back to the voluntary sector. And how, how do we evaluate the voluntary provider to – you know, if it wasn't profitable for Company X, why do we think it's profitable for Company B? I don't understand. I, I, I don't know why they make business decisions. Uh, when it, it's, if it's a return on investment, uh, that's the hospital's decision or the private company's decision to participate in a system. What the fire department looks at is in-service time. Uh, it looks at uh, availability. It looks at overall performance of the provider uh, to see if they will continue in our system. We reevaluate their uh, agreement every two years. Uh, how, how much would it cost to put a third EMS station on Staten Island? Is there an estimate for that? I think the cost for an EMS station has been running about 20 million. Do we need an EMS third station on Staten Island? I would say that we would reassess the uh, right. needs of Staten Island and uh, we would uh, make a determination from there, sir. But like a good determination, right? For you, sir. Thank you. Um, it, it, Twenty million is that all expense or is it all capital or is it a mix? It's uh, capital. Mixed bag. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, Councilmember Brannon, I know you had some questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, Commissioner, I always am a broken record, but I'm going to be until we get it done. The fifth man is super important to me. My constituents, I hear about it all the time. Um, would love to see a day where we restore the fifth man to all 198 engine companies. Is that anywhere on the radar as far as negotiations, or is it a priority at all? Well, I think I'm on record as saying five is always better than four, but, you know, the department has been successfully operating with four firefighter engines for many years. Um, it is not currently... Uh, on our radar or on our request list. There are many things the department needs. Um, having a fifth firefighter in every engine company would not be the highest uh, of those needs in my estimation right now. What, uh, what are some of the things that come before it? Well, I think additional units would be more important. Additional EMS personnel would be more important right now to answer the calls um, than than the cost that we would incur by adding the fifth firefighter to every to every unit. And then uh, putting on my contracts hat, um, has the the department done more to prioritize uh, contracting with MWBEs, and is there any progress there? I think we've made great progress with that, and we have, uh, I think maybe Steve could, could give you some of uh, some numbers, but we have made that a, uh, a very important issue for us. In terms of small purchasing, <clears throat> we're probably at about 30% of our purchases are from w MWBEs. And this year alone, we re-awarded two multi-million dollar contract contracts to large-scale vendors, one for construction and one for temporary services that are now in place. So do, we're doing quite well this year. Okay. And has it been a, you know, a concerted effort to, to prioritize, to focus on that? We have a dedicated staff that works on this. We give constant reminders to units. We meet with the mayor's office to review our targets you know, on, a, on a quarterly basis. So this is high on our radar. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the, the mayor announced the city's going to launch uh, NYC Care, um, which, uh, which is a program to guarantee health care for uh, New Yorkers, including uh, 600000 without insurance. 
Uh, and uh, as we understand it, it will be funded through Metro Plus uh, or uh, through direct care through uh, health and hospitals. Is there any thought that this would also impact your ability to recover costs for EMS services? Certainly, if there is uh, the population right now of uninsured that we service is, runs pretty historically around 20 percent that we're not able to collect from because they really don't have the means to pay. So any type of insurance, whether it be through the Affordable Care Act, that can improve those numbers or the mayor's plan would, would definitely help our revenue numbers as well. So, so have they sort of advised you that now you'd be eligible through Metro Plus to recover some of the money? Once a patient that is identified with insurance when we bill them, um, then we would bill the insurer and we would seek payment from them. But we, we have no details as of yet. Um, so uh, going to civilian overtime for a second. Um, now I don't know who came up with this buzzword, but maybe, maybe you did. I don't know if you did. But the department right-sized the uniform budget. I'm not sure what that means exactly. Uh, but the civilian overtime has not been right-sized yet. Uh, so I, I guess the question is, why is civilian overtime climbing so steadily? There's two aspects when I think when you're talking about civilian overtime, um, and it maybe gets confusing with EMS, it's, you know, in terms of how the city ca categorizes them or in the civilian budget. And EMS overtime is running quite high right now, and that's largely due to the vacancies we have. I got a dictionary definition of right size. I was just giving it. Thank you. Um, is there any talk about uh, re reclassifying EMS as a uniform service? That is a collective bargaining related issue. Would the department support it if it was? There's no reason why we wouldn't. Um, but again, it has, it's a negotiated issue. Um, it, it w would overtime be reduced uh, if there were more uh, EMS employees? Sure. And we're hiring, uh, I guess, as much as our capacity allows at training. Um, is there anything to be done to incentivize the longevity of EMS employees vis-a-vis -vis pay increases? Again, I understand that's contractual. Uh, but is it the department's position that uh, a pay increase uh, for EMS, a step pay increase, let's say, uh, would lead to better longevity amongst the employees? I'm sure it could. It's a good answer, short. <laughs> um, let's just finally circle back around to some diversity. Um, C can you just give us an update on the uh, diversity efforts for firefighters? I know we're, we're still a little far away from seeing the, the results, uh, but uh, w what has happened, anything different this year vis-a-vis uh, -vis last year, or have we expanded or, or anything? Well, the department continues to grow to become more diverse. Uh, the list that we will begin using um, for our next class, the open competitive list, is the most diverse list I think that's been, uh, we've had in our history. So we anticipate that the diversity of the department will, of course, continue to grow in the right direction. Uh, you know, I, I, it was tough to avoid seeing a newspaper article about the spit hoods. And uh, I know we, we had, uh, you know, we, we had made a, a joke about it last month, uh, but then uh, some folks later testified that there was a delay due to the coloring of the hood. Can, can you just sort of answer whether that was sure. true, whether the coloring delayed it by any chance? I think originally, a, f a few years ago, the Medical Equipment Committee, which includes representatives of um, both the MS unions, when evaluating whether the department should purchase um, these hoods and should they be white or black, decided that that would be detrimental to uh, the patients we serve. Uh, we have now found a vendor for a neutral color spit hood, which we are in the process of purchasing, which will have, uh, in those limited cases where these can be effective, because understand that we don't use them on each person we, we treat. That would be uh, rather strange. 
Um, so in those cases where someone is uh, restrained and, and this could benefit our members, we will begin using them as soon as we receive them. Okay. Uh, Council Member Ampri Samuel. Thanks again. Um, in your testimony, you just um, talked about in the beginning just different um, response times. Um, like you responded to over 1.7 million incidents and 1.4 were medical calls. Is there a way for you to um, provide us with information related to response time for elevator calls? Like if, an eleva if, you, if FDNY has to respond to a stalled elevator, do you at all um, track that at all? We do break down all of our calls as to what the nature of the call was. I think we could do some, we can tell you what our response time is to non-fire, non-medical emergencies. Uh, we'd have to do a little more digging to then divide that category up, which includes many other types of emergencies, and find out. But it, we would respond to an elevator emergency in the same manner we respond to any other um, serious emergency. And I would think our response times for our fire units would be quite good for elevator emergencies. It also depends on when, uh, in some cases, if no one is on the elevator with a, with a phone able to contact us, there can be a delay in notification until somebody notices that there's a stuck elevator. But um, we respond promptly to those types of calls. Mm -hmm. The reason why I ask that question is I, I know that you respond promptly to the calls and, and um, I happen to chair the Public Housing Committee and there's always um, firefighters in a lot of our public housing buildings. And so it was just um, interesting just to kind of figure out if there's an increase in um, FDNY having to respond to stalled elevators or broken elevators and what that actually looks like and the impact that would have on your budget and um, responding to other things if our um, many city elevators were actually working and prepared. So that was the reason why I asked that question, just to get a sense of if this is something that's being tracked because we're starting to see an increase in I'm sure we can break down those numbers for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and the last thing uh, I think uh, to talk about, uh, perhaps, uh, is the EEO hires. Uh, so we saw $290,000 added for three positions. Um, what, is the, what is the current overall number of cases the EEO office handles uh, in a year? I don't have that number with me. I don't know if any of us at this table do, but we certainly, I certainly have that number, uh, and we can get it to you, Chair. Okay. I mean, we certainly would like that. I mean, just given the fact that there, there is a peg, um, and we're adding, we're adding employees to a particular office, I just it would make uh, sense to uh, just. I think there has been an increase, not because there's been an. We we don't believe there's been an increase in the number of incidents but because of the, tr of the uh, increased education in the department and informing people of their rights to use the EEO office and the need to use it when, when they should, um, and we've had a positive outcome in that way. So uh, I do believe that the number of people u inquiring of our EEO office has gone up. And uh, do you know roughly how long it takes for an investigation to work its way through and, and, and sort of how often uh, it results in any, uh, any sort of disciplinary uh, action, whether it be just a reprimand or, or something more serious? I think we do have a target and we have improved the, um, I would say it's 90 days is, is our target to complete any EEO investigation. Some of them are more difficult than others and require uh, many more interviews than others. But the length of time from the um, inception of the investigation to the completion has gone down substantially in the past few years. Um, and, and what really will be the final question, because I was looking for this information before and then I finally got the text from staff. Uh, so it, are, we, are we understanding right that uh, 40B and 38W EMS tours were, were given to NYU? 
Brooklyn you're talking about? Correct. I would have to look at those units specifically, but if you're talking about South Brooklyn, those are South Brooklyn radio designations, okay. I'd have to look at that for you. W what would be sort of the justification for going from FDNY EMS to a uh, hospital? W were, they, were they always associated with the hospital? W would you know? I don't know? I don't know if those radio designations were always associated with the hospital. I know what we do is we look at our current staffing model and we look at what we can redeploy into other areas of the city to maintain a service level. And we look to our voluntary providers to uh, help us every now and then get over the, uh, the hill uh, and keep the uh, service in the community at an optimal level. Are, are there voluntary services, whether they're hospitals or anyone else, uh, actively looking to take over tours? Not that I'm aware of at the moment, sir. So it's not, it's not something regular that happens where uh, a, a, a tour and a station or a unit would be put back to a voluntary? We try not to make a habit of it, sir. It's more the opposite. The fire department is more in control of the system than the voluntary sector. Is it, is it better for the FDNY uh, EMS to respond to a scene so that they're better coordinated with all other first responders, or is it better for a voluntary to respond? I think that any ambulance that the uh, fire department sends to uh, an emergency is uh, well equipped and uh, able to manage the emergency that they're confronted with, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, any questions from you guys? No? Thank you all. We'll give a, a two-second uh, break, and then uh, we will have the first panel come up as soon as everyone's clear. Just to, just to be clear, the first panel will be the panel from OEM.
places, everyone places. Let's, let's at least look good. While we're waiting, I'll note we are joined by Council Member Cabrera, who's wearing a nice, uh, a nice uh, aquamarine or the blue. I mean, what would you call that color? Teal, maybe. Nice tie. Do we have to swear in? Uh, Commissioner, I'm afraid we have to swear you and your team in. Andy, how are you? Good to see you. Would you all please raise your right hands? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. You may begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Borelli and members of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. I'm Joe Esposito, the Commissioner of New York City Emergency Management. I'm happy to be here to talk about our fiscal year 2020 budget. And additionally, I hope that my voice is as soothing as Commissioner Borelli's was. Duly noted, and, and indeed it is. Okay, <laughs> thank you. All right, 2018 was a busy year. We activated Emergency Management uh, uh, Operations Center 16 times for a total of 59 days. That includes eight winter weather events, a building vacate due to structural uh, collapse, a boiler outage at New York City Housing Authority facility, Hurricane Maria transitional housing assistance, a heat activation, three flash floods, and the flat iron steam main explosion. During extreme weather events, we, had, uh, we held citywide calls for elected officials and continuously sent out notifications for localized incidents and specific districts, uh, in, in specific districts. In 2018, we monitored 3,661 incidents and sent out citywide incident coordinators to 797 events. We held or participated in 105 interagency exercises to make sure our plans are understood and necessary protocols for plans are ready to be implemented as needed. Our Notify NYC sent out 2,116 messages in 2018, bringing totals to more than 12,400 messages since its inception. The Notify NYC mobile application currently has over 69,700 uh, downloads. This is in addition uh, to growth in our traditional uh, subscribership, puts it at over 742,200 registrants. Notify NYC is also in the midst of a historic expansion project to fulfill city council legislation requiring emergency messages to be issued in non-English speakers in, uh, sev in seven of the most commonly spoken languages in the city. However, in order to further service New Yorkers, Notify NYC is working to meet and exceed the June 19th a requirement by issuing emergency messages in 12 languages. Beginning in June, in addition to the uh, existing account customizations, users can identify their preferred language at the point of registration. We are proud to and excited for this new development. It's really going to bring uh, messaging to a, a, another level for the people that need it the most. Our community outreach and engagement activity continues to grow, and you have likely seen us in your neighborhood at meetings, town halls, fairs, mobile office hours, and other community events. In total, we participated in 943 Ready New York events with more than 100,000 people attending, and we distributed more than 800,000 of our emergency uh, planning guides. We also launched two new preparedness videos focused on people with disabilities and access and functional needs. If you haven't seen them, I encourage you to see them. They're really very well made, and they really send the message home. Uh, we, we graduated six new classes of CERT volunteers, volunteers who continue to work along the city's uh, employees to prepare New Yorkers for emergencies, as well as provide uh, services during disasters. We also thank uh, council members who have provided us with discretionary funding to donate go bags to their constituents. Uh, we recommend that other council members consider doing the same. Uh, this is a tangible benefit, and it's very, uh, it's very helpful in the communities, especially among the vulnerable and the senior populations. 
We hosted a Disabilities and Access Functional Needs a Symposium in December. It was attended by over 160 people representing organizations that service this, this community. The Community Preparedness Program launched a new training for community partners uh, called the Community Preparedness Boot Camp. The boot camp assists local community networks with their emergency uh, planning and, co and connects them with other, other, re other city resources. We also launched the Community Preparedness Council, uh, Council in September. This meets three times a year, and it's a forum for the boot camp participants to discuss emergency planning on a community level and other emergency management topics. It's a way so that people can get together uh, and find out what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, and how we could, how we could better, better utilize this boot camp. We continue to look ahead to find new ways to prepare the city and our citizens for the next emergency. With that, let me now provide a snapshot of our budget for next year. Our projected total fiscal, our, our projected total fiscal uh, 2020 city tax levy expense budget is $30.9 million. We rely on our city tax levy expense budget to support the majority of the agency's administrative, technology, and operational costs. The projected fiscal year 2020 personnel service budget is $7.1 million. This supports 66 personnel lines paid directly through our tax levy funds. This includes $1.6 million in funding for 18 staff members dedicated to working on increasing communications and services to people with access and functional needs. Our other staffing is supported through the grant funds and uh, personnel on assignments from other city agencies. We have a number of uh, people in our emergency management who work for other agencies, uh, and we find that very, very helpful. It brings a nice communication uh, and connectivity to the other city agencies. Our projected fiscal year 2020 other than personnel service budget is $23.8 million, which covers all the agency's operating and administrative costs. These funds are designated to cover our warehouse lease, utilities, and telecommunication costs, including the maintenance and operations of our emergency operation center and our backup facilities. This money also supports our fleet and all the additional equipment, supplies, and material needed to run the agency. The agency receives grant funding to support many of our, 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 our core programs. In the past year, we've secured $25 million in federal funding, primarily through the Urban Area Security Initiative Grant. This funding is vital to our ability to run many of our finest initiatives, including our Already New York Public Education Program, our Community Emergency Response Team Program, our Continuity of Operations Program, the Geographic Information System, our training and exercises, our watch command and response, the citywide incident management system planning, and the emergency supply stockpile. We work with City Hall, OMB, the city's congressional delegation, and other partner agencies to push for full Homeland Security funding in future years. This money supports critical operations within ours and several other city agencies, uh, budgets, and is critical to the city. Uh, again, we couldn't run emergency management without that, without that federal funding. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. I look forward to continue working with the council uh, on issues pertaining to emergency preparedness and response, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. As always, uh, your presence is welcome. Um, were there any new needs that the agency requested from OMB uh, but was not included in the preliminary budget? Yes, but nothing that really affects the, the running of our, our shop day to day. Uh, there's always things that we could do more if we had more funding, but nothing that affects us any, in any critical way. We're always asking for the warehouse, uh, for our office to be expanded, uh, things like that, but nothing that's, that's critical to the operation. So more sprinkles, less cupcake. Yes. Um, Given the peg, uh, it seems that you're you're getting cut three hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. Where where is that going to come from? That'll come from uh, delayed hiring. Uh, you know, we lost some, we lose some. Every agency loses personnel, so we're de we're delaying some of our hiring, and we think we can accomplish the peg by doing that. Is is that a one year cut, or or have you been told that that's going to be baselined? Uh, right now, our information is one year. Um. With respect to the folks that are, so you have 66 employees dedicated to OEM, uh, how many are on assignment from other agencies, roughly? Do you have a number? 
Yeah, probably 30. All, most of our, our, our responders, the folks that go to the jobs on the street, the majority of them are fire and police officers, and there are 20 or 30 of them. We have uh, three or four building people. We have some sanitation. So it's, it's around 30, 35. I don't have the exact can you, can you just take us through, because I think those are the people that uh, the public might see uh, earliest uh, g given uh, an emergency. Can you just take us through their function and what, and what services they're providing on scene? Sure. Our CICs are the folks that they work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, three different tours. And what they'll do is they'll go out to the scene of whatever incident raises to our level of response. Everything from water main breaks, power outages, building collapses, uh, two alarm fires. Is, we have a protocol and they'll go out and they'll respond. And those are the folks that will coordinate the incident right at uh, the location. They'll call the other agencies in, uh, all right, uh, PD, what are you doing? Fire, what are you doing? Building, what, are you, what do you need? Well, what, the way I consider it, we're like the general contractor. You're building a building, you want to go out there, you want to make sure the foundation is going in, you want to make sure the electrician is doing what they got to do, they're not interfering with the plumber. So we, we coordinate uh, the incident and we can bring other resources there. We have the ability through our watch command, we can call and say, uh, we need the building department here, we need sanitation because it, the, 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 the water is freezing because of the fire. Uh, so we're general contractors for the most part. Um, and is there any metric to, to, to like measure the effectiveness of, of the program? I mean, I, I personally think it's a successful program. Um, is there any like, like data we can point to, or is it just more or less, uh, um, I mean, anecdotal, which is fine if it is? Well, we judge it by the response we're getting from, uh, from folks like you. We get calls all the time from the council, other city elected <coughs> officials, uh, asking for our assistance. And the feedback we get is that uh, our folks are doing a, uh, a, a pretty good job. I mean, the, the Dyke of Dyke Heights uh, power outage, uh, we were at that, uh, we handled that. Uh, you know, we get a lot of calls through, through other city agencies to help them with incidents, and the, the feedback is positive. We got a lot of tremendous positive feedback, and that's what we measure it on. And not from the elected officials also. We go out to community meetings. Uh, we're going to community council meetings. We go to uh, uh, district service council meetings, and all the feedback we're getting is very positive. We'll update them on, on jobs that have been happening in their district, in their area of concern, and the, uh, it's been very positive, the feedback. Um. <clears throat> Switching gears to, to funding now. So right now the preliminary budget recognizes 48,000 in federal funding, uh, but the preliminary budget from last year at 23 million. Now, now this is just the cyclical, uh, the, the, the cycle of the federal, the way federal funding hits the city. Coffers. For our, our granting? Mm -hmm. No, we apply every year. We apply every year and uh, it's, we get around 25 million each year. Uh, that's what we need. To, to run our shop. Uh, if they were to cut us, it won't have to uh, uh, trim some of the things we provide. But right now, we get $25 million every year, and uh, it it's really is, is a big part of what we do. Stacey, you want to? No, yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, and also, you're seeing a snapshot. So we usually have three UASI grants in mm -hmm. play at one time. Uh, those aren't all three up for next year. So our, our funding will remain consistent from year to year, but if you look at the snapshot in FMS, it might show a different number. Now, is, uh, is UASI grants the only source of funding, or are there other? It's not the only, funds? but it's the <coughs> primary okay. federal source. And are the other the, the other sources very line item specific for for a specific function, or? Um, well, we get urban search and rescue grants, which are very specific. We also get the local emergency preparedness management grant, which is for emergency management functions. It's more specific than UASI. It's for the operations center, um, but and those are it's generally for personnel. Yeah, um, roughly, uh, roughly, it's 21 million on the UASI grant, and the rest will come in from other other grants. Just uh, w one final question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I <clears throat> got a little cough. So, N NYC, uh, uh, notify NYC uh, has, I think you said, 750,000 people connected. Do you integrate your data with um, commercial apps for that, like Citizen App? We. we we look at all the information. Watch Command monitors everything that comes in. Whatever. No, I mean, I mean uh, the, the opposite. Whereas your information could go to them, I think, cause I think they buy information. Yeah, well, look, we, we suggest that everyone sign up for Notify NYPC. Anybody can sign up. It's a free app, and they can sign up. So if you're a company, you can sign up. And, and uh, many 
companies and services do sign up and they use us uh, for the baseline for their information. And, and from your standpoint, the more ways we disseminate the message, the, the, the better. The more the people have, have the information, the better. We want every person that works or lives in New York City to sign up for Notify NYC. And I, I, is it either of you folks have questions? Uh, Councilmember Cabrera. Uh, in light of, uh, Commissioner, it's good Morning. to see you again. Uh, in light of uh, all the news that we keep getting about global warming and weather changing, is there anything uh, that, in terms of your strategy uh, for this year, you're anticipating, and, and is there any financial impact related to it? Well, we're involved with something called the interim flood protection measures, and this is to try and help us prevent uh, the flooding that happens when you get a hurricane or a big storm. So we're, we're matter of fact, right here, we're working on the, the latest one is right here at the South Street Seaport. We're gonna set up, you may be seeing around the city, they're, they look like big, big sandbags. They're four feet high sandbags. There's some tiger dams that we do. We're, we're, inst we're trying to install them in as many places as possible to keep the water from impacting us during a storm. Uh, and that's a multi-million dollar uh, project that we're doing year to year. Uh, we started City Hall, uh, put us in charge of it a few years ago, and that's been going on uh, you know, day after day. We're doing Staten Island, we've got Red Hook, uh, we've done the Bronx, uh, Manhattan, Brooklyn, well, uh, just about all five boroughs uh, have got some type of this program in place. And what would you say is the most unprotected uh the what? Uh, most unprotected um, council district in terms if we were to have a hurricane again, uh, like Sandy. I remember well, being in the Rockaways, you know, yeah. water. Uh, I was well, that would depend on, on the storm that's coming in, depending on the direction. Now, Sandy, originally we thought it was going to hit the Bronx. It, it changed that, uh, you know, before it hit, and it hit the shore areas, Staten Island, Rockaway. So it really depends on the storm that's coming in, what direction it's coming in from. But for the most part, it's your coastal areas, and that's what we're concentrating on. We're concentrating on the coastal areas. But is there a particular area that we have not done work? I know there were some, uh, there are, um, the U.S. Army engineers Corps came engineers. in and did some work, and you know, to to better be able to handle, you know, surge. There are there areas that you would say, hey, we should be mindful of. Oh, without a doubt, we have not protected the entire city. It's just it's just an ongoing process that we've got to do day in and day out. So if if a hurricane were to come or a superstorm like saying would come again, we would have our issues. But I think we're, we're better prepared now than we, we ever have been. Some of the areas that got flooded would not flood because of the summer measures we've done. But again, it's an ongoing process. There are still areas of the city that are still unprotected. Well, thank you, Commissioner, and I really appreciate all the work that you do. You're one of the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, we're also joined by Council Member Maisel, who rounds out the uh, the committee. So perfect attendance for all of us. Great. Um, Justin, do you have questions? No. I, I guess the, the question that the public wants to know is, is uh, in an emergency, how quickly will we resort to cannibalism, uh, given the supplies that you maintain for us? Have you been watching The Walking Dead? Is that why lost. I'm getting that question? I'm thinking more lost, you know. <laughs> okay. Now, well, as you know, we have a warehouse. We have three warehouses. We can supply 70,000 people for seven days with uh, many of the necessary things they would need. So I think capitalism is, is a long way off. Okay. It's very, right. very comforting. Okay. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, folks. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Yeah, we'll take a, a one-minute break, uh, and then we'll get the next uh, panel up. And the next panel will be, yep, uh, Vincent Variali, Oren, Michael, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll do another panel. Is Oren on twice? Oh, okay.
Gentlemen, it's nice seeing you guys. Thank you. So as usual, who wants to start? Lauren, please. <laughs> Warren, please uh, begin with you. Good morning. Good morning to all council members. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak today. My name is Oren Barzale, president of FDNY EMS Local 2507, uniform EMTs, paramedics, and fire inspectors. As we, all, we are all aware, Congress failed to rescind disproportionate share hospital payment cuts that became effective on October 1st, thereby reducing the critical federal funding that reimburses hospital through the medical program, through the Medicaid program for uncompensated healthcare costs. These cuts will decimate New York's hospitals and fall hardest on its public and safety net, net hospitals that are already strained and serve the neediest patient population. EMS, even now, EMS budgets are razor thin across the state. As a result of the White House administration budget cuts, New York proposed 2019 budget would require further cuts in service. As part of the revision to the Health and Mental Hygiene Bill, S-1507A-2007, the proposal will eliminate Medicaid payments for low-income and elderly patients, insured by both Medicaid and Medicare, a decision that could cost all EMS agencies statewide an estimated total cost of 14 million per year. Additionally, a 2017 New York State Department of Health report showed ambulance providers are already substantially shortchanged by Medicaid and recommended rate increases of 31 million in 2017. This financial Armageddon is not a standalone issue. Increasing call volume, growing population, and a shrinking department budget will spell trouble for a system already on the back breaking stress. The EMS providers, the EMS provide, handle 80% of the call volume with just 14% of the fire department's budget. It is becoming imperative that the budget be aligned with the reality of the situation we are facing. Any budget reduction to the emergency medical service will result in a loss of ambulance shifts on a daily basis, which when, uh, which when coupled with the current staffing issues will result in a response that creeps up to an unacceptable level. There's been recent articles in the past few days, few weeks, showing ambulance services companies across the state shutting down due to Medicaid reimbursements. It is only a matter of time before it hits New York City. The commissioner's testimony, which we are grateful for him, has been a very supportive to EMS force. But as he stated, 25% increase in EMS calls nationwide. A new uh, fire department records show that in 2017, we had 1.8 million calls. In 2018, we had 1.9 million calls. We are constantly breaking records. At the pace we're going, we're going to hit 2 million calls this year. That's unheard of, 2 million EMS runs. While we are grateful they are doing construction at two EMS facilities and expanding them, there is no mention of any new facilities. In the proposal merger, in the merger proposal rather, which we can provide the council, there is a mention of 70 EMS stations. We haven't grown in years. We are still busting at the seams. I'm grateful that the commissioner will support us being recognized as a uniform service, but the law is already in place. 
The problem is the mayor is refusing to do so. They had no answers for 3-3 three, three boy, 3-8 three, William, and 4-0 boy. The fact is they're giving those units away because they can't keep up with the staffing issue. The call volume is increasing. Our, line is, our lines are decreasing. Rather than the FDNY taking over, serving these communities, they're giving them away. With this New York State budget cuts, as in past history, we've had communities left unattended when they one night decided to fold up and not give any notification to the FDNY, leaving us, the EMTs, paramedics of the city of New York and Vinny's officers, stranded and scrambling to cover these shifts to protect and serve the public. There was a question about the lockers. We still have a problem with lockers. Their solution was, let's cut these lockers in half, replace them, and cut their space. We have no room for our equipment. With half-sizing these lockers, they want us to leave our equipment hanging on the floor, put boots on top of the lockers that are soiled with whatever they're contaminated with. Huts and yards. I'm not sure where they're gonna get these resources. Our members are already giving all they have. How much overtime can they do? This issue is not going away. Our staffing is critical. Vinny. I just want to ask you a question. Oh. <clears throat> Can you just go over the, those numbers again uh, on the calls? You said there was uh, 1.8 million in 2017, then 1.9 million last year, and now we're on pace for 2 million, two million calls. Is that the first time in the, in the city's history we'll hit two million? First time ever. Um, and I, just, just to add my own commentary, I, mean, I think it's very rare, uh, and it highlights the problem a great deal, when you have a, a union saying that there's actually too much overtime f for the members. I mean, this is, this is something that just, I mean, it, it is almost comical. I mean, it, I mean and j just, to, just to demonstrate how much stress is placed on, on members and how much they have to work. Uh, so with that, I will just uh, give it up for, uh, for Vincent. Uh, thank you. I just to add to that, uh, other jobs, because everybody in EMS has two or three jobs, other jobs I've been to, you're right. There would be, there'd be fights in the hallways for about an hour, to get an hour or two hours of overtime extra for the day, and in EMS, it's the complete opposite. It's like you got overtime, and everybody's running the other direction because, like, I had enough already this week. I did 60 hours, 70 hours already, you know, and they don't want the overtime uh, at that point. Um, unfortunately, we need to work that overtime just to make a livable wage, and that's the pro that's a big problem. Um, well. <clears throat> I guess now it's, yeah, it's still morning. Okay, so good morning, Chairman Joseph Borelli and distinguished members of the City Council. My name is Vincent Varialli. I am president of Local 3621, the Uniformed EMS Officers Union, representing over 500 EMS lieutenants and captains of the New York City Fire Department Emergency Medical Services Bureau. I thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. Uh, the EMS Bureau of the FDNY has an abundance of pilot programs and contingency plans to address the many operational needs and emergency scenarios. However, the ability to adequately implement and operate these plans have been, have been severely lacking. This year marks 23 years since the EMS merger into the FDNY. The genuine concern demonstrated by our Fire Commissioner Daniel Nigro for the issues that would improve the quality of life for EMS personnel and the services provided to the people of the city are appreciated. However, many of the issues that have negatively impacted the service for years continue even today. When EMS worked on the Health and Hospitals Corporation, we were poorly compensated, severely understaffed, lacked an adequate span of control ratio, and required additional stations throughout the city. These same issues continue to plague EMS, and the lack of retention 
currently at 60% with less than three years experience, hinders our ability to provide the best pre-hospital care for the people of this city. Sometime after the merger, the City Council passed local laws 18 and 19, providing uniform status for members of the EMS workforce. The purpose of this legislative accomplishment was to provide EMS with the same level of support that is provided to other emergency first responders and uniform services. Unfortunately, that objective was not achieved, and we're still fighting for that recognition today and support. While campaigning for a second term, Mayor de Blasio promised to address the inequalities that exist and bring the people of this city's fairness and equality. Those are his words. I ask the members of this committee and the entire city council to hold the mayor to that promise and provide EMS with the funding needed to address these issues mentioned and deliver the fairness and equality he promised. Thank you very much. I'm available for any questions. <laughs> uh, one thing I would like, like to mention further uh, that was talked about in the speech by the commissioner, I noted there's nothing in the budget, even though they said they're uh, renovating facilities, there was nothing there to add additional, you know, more facilities for EMS. Um, there was nothing in there for compensation from members, like, for example, the uh, fly car program was mentioned. Those members today are still working three jobs. They're working as a lieutenant, a paramedic, and a trainer. They're training their partner, the paramedic that just got the job. Um, they are still paid the same amount of money. How is that fair or equal? We are already overworked, and as Oren stated, we're gonna be hitting two million jobs. So we're already working, the horse is already pulling the wagon, we're overheating, and now we're added, a, given additional workload, and we're not being compensated or being uh, respected or treated fairly in any way to uh, address that workload. Uh, taking the pay out of it, just quickly, is the sure. fly car program successful? They're, say, they're pointing that their success is getting uh, the unit to an ALS um, call faster that it's happening. However, other things are faltering, and that's the problem. It's like you're giving up some other stuff that are important to, to achieve one goal. Um, supervision, span of control ratio is suffering from it. Uh, so is it working? I don't know. It depends if you're looking narrowly in one area. It might be according to their numbers, but overall, it really it needs, it's, like I st stated in my uh, testimony, there are, it's a pilot program that isn't properly supported and is not, and compensation is a big deal with it because let's face it, if an employee is angry going to work, how well do you think that job is gonna be done? They're gonna do what they have to do because they love EMS, they love the job, they're not gonna screw the people of the city over, but you know, when you're angry about something, it does, it's not gonna be the best productivity you're gonna get. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael Greco. I'm the vice president of Local 2507. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I want to thank you, Chairperson. I want to thank the other council members for listening to us. Um, we've been here before, I feel. I, sometimes I feel like a broken record, and I actually feel like I'm taking crazy pills because it's a broken record that goes on and on and on. You have a system that's about to do two million calls. We are the biggest largest EMS system in the world. We are understaffed, underfunded, underappreciated. I really do appreciate Commissioner Nigro coming out and giving a very simple answer. Would pay help? Yes. Pay would help. We are paid significantly less. I'm listening to the budget and the money that is spent on equal opportunity recruitment. I listen to the money that's being spent for bathrooms for females on a fireside, a historic level of 77 females. I just pulled up the budget from last year that talked about the numbers. In EMS, the numbers, male versus female, we had 3,400 male. We have 1,104 females. We have a diversity makeup of 35% white females. The rest would be considered non-white. We are the most diverse group of emergency responders. And when you look at our pay, when you look at what's going on, I just looked up a lieutenant 
she's a friend of mine, and she currently is at 60% overtime. That is 2,000 hours and 60% on top of that. That's 1,200 hours of overtime. Her pay is 145,000. That sounds amazing. That is almost 4,000 hours. She does not see her kids. She does not see her husband. She lives here five days a week and has to go to Pennsylvania for the two days because that's where her house is because she can't afford to be here. That is the level that we are at right now. When you talk about stations, we obviously need them. I had the, uh, the councilwoman bring up Rescue 2, new station in your district. The question was, what is going on with the old Rescue 2? Did anybody think to maybe renovate it a little bit and give it to us? It seems like it's a city-owned property. There's plenty of things. that They're renovating a lot of things. Give us our stations. 70 stations we were promised 20 years ago, 23 years ago, and we've gotten a couple. And our stations are not these beautiful um, Rescue 2 you're seeing outside your win window. They are trailers underneath um, the Triborough Bridge with pigeon feces constantly going. We use bricks to cover our cars with hospital sheets so every day we don't come with 400 pigeon droppings on a car. That is what they're supporting us with. 14% of the budget, 1.5 million calls. There is a diversity problem that is glaring to everybody in our service. There is a retention problem that's glaring to our service. So if they don't have the facility to hire more than 180, get me the facility to hire 320. There's, I don't see that in the budget. The, the retention rate of our salary is atrocious. It's amazing that we are giving units away because we're having trouble hiring, but we have no problem bringing 1,200 people in a year and a half promoting to fire. That class that they just so... They, they got up here and, and they wanted to be recognized for the amount of females, 15. That's amazing. We, I, I want hundreds to be in the fire service. But those 15 females were EMS. They, fi, FDNY did not gain 15 females. FDNY moved 15 females. We are civilian. So therefore, now they're uniform. So it looks like they gained. They didn't gain one person. They took from us and put it on a dress of EEO compliance. If you were to pay us the same, let me see how many of those people will go over. There's a reason why we have 35% female. There's a reason why we have over 1,000. Because people love doing this job. And without this council's help, because I'm not sure if the fire department has the ability to wave this wand. They can ask for things, but it is the budget. It is the mayor. And I'm being very polite when I say, please talk to him and make him readdress the way he looks at us. Because despite what he feels, despite of the recognition and the support we get, we have some of the greatest EMTs, paramedics, and officers that the world knows. It'd be nice if somebody besides us looking at each other recognized that. Thank you. So just to, just to give you an update since our, our last hearing, um, we are looking at reintroducing uh, the 2001 law with respect to how the courts ruled on it uh, and seeing if there's a new way to introduce it. Our, our counsel is not here today. He's going to be on paternity leave for a couple weeks, so, um, but, but he's, the, he's the smart one. I'm just the, I'm just the good looking face. Um, but if you Me and Oren have that same problem. <laughs> exactly. We so don't know, know who's the good looking you know, face, though. You, you know how it is. <laughs> so just, uh, I, I, I'm hoping we get some movement on it um, within well, the next you. few months. Thank you. That's, great. That's great news. Uh, yeah. I would like to address something that they said about the radio straps. Our chief of EMS sat there and said it's an OSHA. I have not found the OSHA compliance. They sell carbon monoxide keychains. They have belt clips on them. People in other services use this on their belt. It's something they say. I have not seen the proof that it needs to be at eye level or not. It is a barely above, this is the science of it, it's barely lighter than air which means it's almost neutral. It, it disperses evenly throughout a room. 
Um, that's why sometimes you see a carbon monoxide on a baseboard, sometimes you see it on a ceiling. Um, so you can have it any way you want. It is a safety issue that is currently under review in safety, according to them. So to have it sit here and be like, oh, it has to be as per an OSHA requirement, it, it's, it's not. Thank you, guys. Can I, can I just it? add something oh, to sorry. that? Yes, please. Uh, our uniformed uniforms are designed. There's a, there's a, uh, a lapel. There's a strap okay. that, that allows you to put that meter or the radio to attach it to it on your shirt. Many people hang their radio mics on it. Right. It's, I think it's called an epaulet. Mm -hmm. And Orman's correct. You can put a CO meter on there as well. Quite frankly, the radio strap is uh, my view for EMS. It's a hazard, a safety hazard, because uh, just like when we walk around with the uh, stethoscope, I used to put my stethoscope through the epaulet because if you get caught by an EDP, a mostly disturbed person, who wants to strangle you with it, sure. just like with the strap, you don't want them to be able to pull you with it. So having the radio strap actually could endanger your life more than, uh, and we've had issues where members were grabbed by the radio belt. Uh, one in particular was a flash flood in Queens where two EMTs were pulling somebody out of a car under a bridge and the wiper blade caught onto the radio strap. Well, I think, I think Mike uh, effectively but, argued this point uh, last hearing when he said you don't want to hit the patients in the head with the radio. I think that's a very, it's that's very, a, that's very, a good very point. strong yeah. argument. And, exactly. and, and one small thing, they issue us clip-on ties for our Class A uniforms and our other uniforms because it's a hazard to have a tie. Right, well, thank you, guys. Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think, is she here? Nancy Carbone, or did she leave? Okay, then we'll just have Benjamin Chow and David Lin. Gentlemen, uh, begin whenever you like. Okay. Um, good morning, committee chair. Press the microphone. Oh, no. oh, okay. <laughs> good morning, committee chair and distinguished council members. Um, my name is Benjamin Chu. I'm the vice president of the FDNY Phoenix Society. I'm a firefighter assigned to Engine Company 298 in Jamaica, Queens. Um, my name is David Lim, the president of the FDNY Phoenix Society. Um, I am the, you know, um, I work at a recruitment. Uh, we are from the FDNY Phoenix Society. Our, objecti our object objective is to uh, unite in the effort of promoting the interests and welfare of the fire department personnel who are Asian Americans or those of Asian descent. The FDNY Phoenix Society seeks to enhance the Asian American community and the New York City Fire Department by networking amongst those interested in professional and personal development while emphasizing, emphasizing the pres preservation of Asian American identity. The society provides resources and guidance that inspire, empower, develop, and support professionalism within the FDNY to become community-oriented leaders. The FDNY Phoenix Society strives to promote community relations, career growth, leadership, networking, public service, and most importantly, family-oriented events. So the society's pretty much about, found about five, uh, since 2012. Um, is recognized by, by, by the department in 2013 in spring. Um, so, and recently, so we've been acknowledged for our outstanding effort uh, throughout the city. Um, we, you know, we try to engage the, uh, the Asian communities and build, and it's like cultural bridge between us and the fire department. Um, we recently uh, received $13,500 in discretionary funding from Council Member Peter Ku and Margo Chen uh, for our initiative in um, recruitment process. So that money is being used to, for career enhancement to, uh, to train new incoming firefighter candidates, um, EMS candidates, and administrative staff as well too. Overall, we want, what we want to do is we want to let our community know that, hey, their public service is a great and admirable position. Um, it is a service that is, is a give back to the community. Um, and we want to and we want to increase more members in the department. Um, recently, for this year, we um, asked for additional uh, resource um, of thirty-five thousand dollars through discretionary funding. Um, so, one of the things that uh, we've been 
working with the department and the foundation is their language class. And Ben can talk more about that. We hold our language class uh, biannually uh, at Flushing High School. We do, uh, we open the language class to every member within the department. So it's our way of giving back to the department a little bit, we teach free Mandarin language class. We have a professional teacher come in every Tuesday. The primary reason for language class is when, um, when first responders respond into patient care. And with the Asian community grow, um, grow, continue growing throughout Queens, Brooklyn, and throughout the city, we want to, we want to reduce patient care response time. Um, basic information such as, a, why, did you call, um, why did you call 911? Um, you know, what, what, uh, what, you know uh, what is your pain level? Basic stuff like that. This is what we can communicate with the members. Um, and this is actually being uh, funded by, uh, by the FDY Foundation. Um, $7,500 were given uh, for this current fiscal year, and we're currently on our second term right now. A class being held at Flushing High School. Um, all department personnel attend, whether they're fire marshal, firefighters, EMS, and administrative staff personnel. Uh, that includes attorneys as well. So, um, so, so there are three major areas that we would like to continue working with the department to enhance um, our effort. Uh, one of them is continue recruitment efforts in the Asian community. Uh, and these positions of firefighter, EMS, fire prevention, and administrative staff support. Um, one of the key areas that the department uses um, are Firefighter Mobile Academy and EMS Mobile Academy. What those are, uh, are they are engagement events with current test takers um, and uh, future uh, applicants as well too. Um, and Ben can talk a little more about the- Yes, I've worked with mobile uh, the Mobile Academy before with Community Affairs. Um, it's something that we, you, we, see, we have seen it to be helpful within the community, especially for something that's foreign in our culture, as Asian culture is the fire department. Um, it's a hands-on experience for uh, young adults and members of the community to see what we do and what, what the job would be anticipate, I guess, what to, to expect from the job, and especially if they're candidates trying to get into the job. So uh, I feel that's something that it's something that's important that we continue within the community to show, to show familiar, familiarity. So in these events, so for example, for Fire for Mo uh, Mobile Academy, um, applicants and candidates, they're being given bunker gears. They're trying it on. They can actually envision themselves what is it like to be in a uniform position. Um, and you know, for the very first time, you put it on a, um, a helmet on and um, and bunker pants on. It's a great sensation over there. You envision yourself being in this position. Now you can actually see it by wearing the equipment. Um, and there's PT uh, given as well too, such as simple stuff as hose drag, push-ups, um, burpees. And there's also given. Uh, so that's for the firefighter side. EMS has the same thing as well too, where um, there's EMS uh, fire, EMS Mobile Academy. Um, and there you're given patient care. You're teaching the individual, hey, what's it like to assess a patient? You put BSI on, which is a pair of glo uh, your gloves on, and you're taking your pulse. You're taking the blood pressure. You're asking the individual, hey, you know, are you hurt? You do a little role play situation. And um, can applicants are also shown um, the MERV unit. You know, basically it's a um, emergency response uh, vehicle. And n a lot of people have never seen that before. So it's exposure to fire department careers. Um, and these are uniform careers that Potentially, we want um, we can we want to show our communities to save lives. Um, what we notice is that there's a lack of firefighter mobile academy and EMS academy within the Asian community. And we how can we how can the department partner up with it? The department's doing a great job so far right now, but we want the department to move forward in a correct direction and continue that part. And you, the department can partner up with community uh, with board of education, community boards, and elected official demographic area because council members here you have. You, your community represent the demographic that the department needs to continue diversifying it. You know, we would like to see more um, people that have the multilingual skill um, in addition to the face. And the other thing is what uh, we, want to uh, we want to start is um, we notice that nutrition is a big thing uh, with our candidates. So we can tell our candidates, go ahead and study and go to PT class, you know, go ahead and go run and whatnot. But without the proper tools such as nutritional diet, they don't know how to do this. How many, like, proper nutrition? It's like eating correctly, feeling correctly. You know, um, if you don't take care of yourself um, in the inside, then how how can you perform your job? And that applies to not just firefighters, but for also also for EMS, because EMS you're constantly on the go, and you're not eating correctly. You're, and then what what does this all lead into? It leads into injuries, long-term injuries. It leads to weight gain. Um, the number one reason for 
um, for medical leave and even um, uh, three, quarter, uh, three quarter is actually cardiac. So if you can tell someone, hey, how to eat correctly, they can actually reduce this, um, you know, uh, long-term um, uh, medical, uh, medical as well. So, I mean, that's one thing that we noticed the department doesn't have is a nutritionist. Um, and it's just one person. And we have everything in the fire department. We have nurses, we have doctors, um, we have um, tech folks um, that handles our cell phones, and et cetera. Why don't, why, I mean, having a nutritionist would be a great idea to have. Um, and the other thing is physical equipment. So we, the department tried other things and was in partnership with the foundation by having a, um, a rowing competition in the department. And what that does is um, the purpose to engage um, team building and to put a, um, a row machine in every firehouse and EMS station. Um, a row machine is a simple, non-impact uh, body workout uh, as opposed to running. It reduces um, pressure on joints. So you can still get the same cardiac benefits uh, without stress on your joints. So the department can use more stuff such as stair masters um, for, uh, so the folks can work out um, on their own time. Um, the Jacob ladder, basically the ladder that climbs up um, where you're climbing up this, uh, upward. Um, ski ERG and assault runners. So assault runners basically is a treadmill without um, a motor inside. Um, it's curved on the bottom. And what that does is it, uh, it promotes proper running. And it's, it's cardio benefits. And at, at the end of the day, it's a stressful job. Um, and what better way to release stress than just have a simple workout, whether it's 15 minutes a day, that's, a, that's 15 minutes of cardio that, that, that can actually save your life. And it ties in with the nutrition as well, too. Um, the point is to live long and, uh, and healthy. Um, let's see, and then, um, so what we would like the department, we'd like to work with the department continuous, um, is fire safety education, FDNY CPR, and underrepresented neighborhoods um, in a multilinguistic platform. Currently right now, there are fire safety being given throughout the city. Um, they're on average about 10 a day, but there are less than one that are given in a multilinguistic linguistic neighborhood, such as in the Asian demographic. Um, and our society, we have the skill set to help the department, um, but we are being pushed back a little bit uh, because it is an overtime issue, and we do understand that, and we don't want to increase your budget. Uh, but however, the, we're not asking for um, to have an event every single day. Um, we simply just want to spread the message because what we notice is when we go out and give out fire safety education uh, seminars, we notice that the Asian community are afraid to call 911. One of the misconceptions is that if you call 911, there's a fee associated. Um, if we never went out and asked the community that, we never known. Um, and that actually leads to, you know, lives lost. Let's just say you have a fire or someone has cardiac, uh, when the cardiac arrest, they're afraid to call 911 because you don't have, um, they're, they're, they're afraid that there's a fee associated, or maybe if they're not here um, legally. So we don't want anyone to get killed. Um, we just pre pre uh, preventive measures. Yeah. Um, and we as a, well, we as a society would like to be that bridge between the community, with such a major demographic in the city, and the department. Um, we have the, we just need the tools kind of to, we just need the tools to help us do this. Um, major thing that David was touching on is that the Asian community, we, in, a, in, our, in our culture, it's, it's big to use incense and candles and a lot of these things pose fire risks and, fire sa and dangers within, uh, with fire. In regards to language skills, um, it's not just one dialect, such as Mandarin or Cantonese. We have various uh, di uh, languages. We have 43 different countries under us. Um, so it ranges anywhere between us, um, you know, from Japanese to Pakistani, Bangladesh, and you have every other language in between. Our society, we have members that speak these languages. We have members that speak Burmese, Cantonese, Thai, Vietnamese, Korean, um, Bangladesh, um, and Urdu, et cetera. Um, and we just, all we want to do is just help the department out with this, uh, with this workshop. Um, there are also currently no Asian outreach liaison within the department. Um, it's a position that I last held in, 20, um, in between 2016 and 2017. So between 2017 and now, there aren't, the fire department's not engaging with the Asian community. Um, two years is a huge time frame. Um, and you know, it's, it's a relationship that you want to build, just like the NCO program uh, NYPD has. You know, we just want to engage with the community. Um, 
We, and the other thing is the last part is uh, block parties. There's a community engagement event. Um, essentially, it is a national night out event from NYPD. Um, the current location that's being held in the Asian demographic neighborhood is in Councilman Raku's uh, district, uh, which is in Flushing. And it was held there twice in 2017 and 2018. What we want to do is want to expand that. You know, why, why is it just in one neighborhood? Why can't it be somewhere else? Why can't it be in Chinatown, in Brooklyn? There are four neighborhoods in Brooklyn, Sunset Park, Bensonhurst, Bay Parkway, and Sheepshead Bay. Queens, there are other areas, Sunnyside, Jackson Heights, Elmhurst, Murray Hill, Bayside, and Jamaica. Those areas represent different demographic other than Chinese. Because um, there are, within the Asian community, there are other areas, other ethnic groups as well. What we like is, uh, instead of just having a standard hot dogs and hamburgers, utilize the local businesses. Um, so if it's being held in, say, um, um, Sun uh, Sunset Park, utilize the local businesses, local cuisines over there. Give back to the small businesses and to our community. And what that does is, you have people coming into these block parties, and they want to, they're, they're intrigued in trying to use these food, but they never had it before, you know? So whether it be um, a barbecue pork bun, um, or something as Vietnamese noodle, which is like pho, um, or um, Vietnamese iced coffee. Something like that, that can be part of the block parties that the fire department have. Um, instead of giving, back, giving to a big corporate company such as Fresh Direct, that's where they get all the supplies from, give back to the small businesses. And, you know, um, and what a better way to showcase another culture is by breaking bread and, you know, and, and, and tasting it. So, um, and we would like to thank the Fire Emergency Com uh, Management Committee for your time and continue fighting for the city. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. No, no question. Thanks. Seeing no one else here to testify, uh, Orn? Do, do you want? Uh, <laughs> well, thank you guys for coming, everyone. <laughs>